Welcome to the Business Speak Podcast, where we take everything you need to know about being successful in business and make it easy to understand. Whether you're a longtime business owner, newer to this entrepreneur stuff, or hoping to run your own company in the future, you've come to the right place. Featuring your host, professional accountant and business guru, Mr. Chill. So relax and have some fun with us as we journey through business speak, the language of business simplified. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Business Speak podcast, a podcast devoted to helping business owners, both current and prospective, kind of understand a little bit better about all the ins and outs of business. I'm your host, Mr. Chill. It's kind of a fun name I get to use. My real name's Corey. You can call me either one. One of the things that we get to do here on the podcast, every episode, we uh, kind of choose a topic that we feel would be beneficial for you to know more about, to dive deeper into, and that might get you excited and curious and help you along your journey of being a business owner and an entrepreneur. It's perhaps not a surprise then that we would devote an entire episode to our topic today. Our topic today is on entrepreneurship, and I don't think there's much of a better person we could have on our show for that topic than our guest today, uh, Drew Woolsey. I'd like to thank you for joining us on our podcast. Thanks for having me, Corey. Happy to be here. Yeah. Now, Drew is, I'm probably going to butcher it, so I'll let him correct what I get wrong, but He is the Chair of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at NATE, um, which is a post-secondary school in Northern Alberta, uh, particularly specializing in trades and such. And does more than that, there's a whole school of business too. So welcome, Drew. Um, Before we get too far into this, uh, just based on the topic, and obviously it's something that's near and dear to you, what are you kind of looking forward to today or what's kind of exciting for you that we should hoping to talk about today. So as you mentioned, I'm an entrepreneurship teacher and sometimes I have to pinch myself a little bit because I I just love entrepreneurship and I love how it fits in the business world. And so this idea that somehow I get paid to go and talk about something that I really care about and I'm really excited about is is, is amazing. Uh, And so the fact that you and I get to just talk a little bit more about those things that I really enjoy and really love, this is is exciting for me too. Cool. Yeah. Well... All right, we're going to dive into some of those things, and I'm excited to see your excitement for it. (laughs) All right. Now, I used to introduce all of our guests, and that works okay. Um, But I think no one's more passionate about you than you. Maybe your wife, I don't know. (laughs) But um, So why don't you take a moment and just sort of introduce yourself to our audience? Awesome. Uh, So I'm born and raised in Alberta. Uh, So I actually grew up in Lethbridge. Went to high school in Medicine Hat, uh, and my family and I moved to Edmonton in 2011. Uh, so I, about to kind of go give a little bit of background on maybe how I got here, is when I was a kid, I was super shy. And I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't look people in the eye. I, yeah, just really shy. And when I was 14, I moved from Lethbridge to Lesser Slave Lake for a year. And I was shy as a kid, but then when I moved to a new town where I didn't know anybody, I went like even shyer. Like I didn't talk to anybody. Uh, I ended up moving to Medicine Hat after that, went to high school. Maybe it was a little bit less shy, but not really. Uh, and then I got my first job, a real job uh, at a retail sports store. And I was supposed to be selling things and I couldn't talk to anybody. Like <laughs> they had to force me, says, Drew, go and talk to that person. <laughs> and the best I could do was, thanks for coming in or let me know if you need any help. And that's all I could do. Luckily, I got a little bit, like I got a little bit better where I could talk a little bit more over the year that I was there. And then through my church, I had the opportunity to uh, go work as a missionary for two years. And that all you do is talk to people. And so I had to figure that out. Uh, and it actually changed me dramatically as a person where I could talk to people and I could teach people and I could talk like this. Uh, so much so that when I came back, I actually thought I wanted to be a religious educator. That was kind of my path in life. I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to teach religion. Uh, And then I started looking up to see how much those people made. (laughs) It wasn't very high. And I thought, no, actually, I don't want to do that anymore. And that's when I decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So my grandpa was an entrepreneur. My uncle, a couple uncles were entrepreneurs. My, both my parents kind of 
flitted in and out of entrepreneurship. So it was in my family, but I never really thought that that's something I wanted to do. Uh, but then when I, again, this is my early 20s, um, I've got a little bit more fire in me and I wanted to make some money. I thought I want to be rich was my goal. So I thought entrepreneurship is the key. Uh, so I went back to school. I got a degree in management uh, and then um, kind of had a couple jobs here and there. And then I was living in Lethbridge at the time and there was a ad to teach one entrepreneurship class at night at Lethbridge College. I had no teaching experience. I didn't have a teaching degree. Uh, as a missionary, I had taught people. And so I knew I liked teaching. Somehow I convinced them to give me a shot and they let me teach one entrepreneurship class at night. And I really just fell in love with it. Again, as I said before, I was talking about something that I like with people who were also passionate about it. And I just loved it. And Lethbridge College apparently thought I did an okay job because they let me do it again the next year. And then they just kept offering me more and more classes to the point where at the time I was a mortgage broker, that was my full-time job, but I was basically teaching a full load of classes at the college at the exact same time. Wow. So I had two jobs uh, and I was losing my mind. And so I finally decided I had to do one or the other. And it was never the goal to be a teacher. As, as I said, when I was young, I was super shy. So the thought of standing up in front of a group of people and teaching them was an impossibility. Like it was not, not even in the realm of possibility. Uh, but then I decided, no, I really like teaching. Uh, mortgage broker was great. I actually made more money doing that, but I was gone all the time. Uh, evenings, weekends, just whenever the bit where there was business, I was out doing it. Uh, so I decided to go back to school, get a master's in business so that I could get a job teaching full-time. Uh, so I did my master's full-time at the exact same time I was teaching full-time, which was kind of a hellish two years. I would not <laughs> suggest that for anyone, uh, but I did that. Uh, and then I ended up applying for a whole bunch of jobs after that, uh, just to kind of test the waters. Uh, and Nate offered me a job in the school of business, uh, initially teaching marketing, because uh, I had some sales experience. Uh, after one phone interview, they gave me a job, <laughs> magically, I don't know why. Uh, but we've been here since 2011. Uh, four years ago, I became the chair of the entrepreneurship program. That's really where my passion is. I just love entrepreneurship. Uh, and so now I I chair that program plus the marketing program and then I teach uh, entrepreneurship classes. So, And uh, yeah, so I've been at Nate for 13 years now teaching entrepreneurship and it's uh, I really enjoy it. And is that 13 years flown by? Uh, <laughs> it feels like it. Yeah, I mean, it's gone fast. Yeah, as you know, sometimes days and months or weeks go very slow. <laughs> but uh, the, the, one of the best things about being a teacher is each semester is like three and a half months. So if you have a good semester, three and a half months and it's over and you got to start again. If you have a bad semester, three and a half months and it's over <laughs> and you get to start again. I really like that idea of you just, it's almost like I'm starting fresh every three and a half months. Have you found that it was, I know that you said that entrepreneurship was your thing. I'm not sure at that time you thought that teaching entrepreneurship was your thing as much as I imagine you thought of yourself running a, your own business perhaps. Any, I don't want to say regrets, but like there's obviously very different than you probably pictured. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, I went into business school because I thought I wanted to be rich. And as most people probably are aware, teachers uh, don't get paid the kind <laughs> of money that would classify as rich. So this was never the goal. Never, ever. I, would, like, I was not going to do this. Um, I really like teaching. It's amazing. Uh, but I think about that all the time. I think... Because I've had lots of little businesses, like even in, like my first, my very first business was I was in grade nine in high school, uh, and I started a sports card store. So this is in the in the early '90s when sport card sports cards were everywhere. So I actually opened up a little shop in my basement, and then I would go to the mall and set up every Saturday. So still this very shy kid. So it didn't go very well, and I didn't make very much money. <laughs> uh, but that was my very first business, and I've had lots since then, but they've all been very small. And so I think about that, like if I get to be 75 years old and I've never kind of gone all in with a business, will I regret that? And I think I will. Uh, and so I, I've been toying with some things and um, I kind of jumped into a little bit of something a little bit bigger this year. But uh, but yeah, I think if I am only ever a teacher, not that that's not good and teachers are great and they do lots of good things. But yeah, I think, I think there will be some regret if I don't uh, go all in at some point. Well, I don't know when and where that looks for you, but you do have a side business now. You want to tell them about that? I think it's a food truck doing some cool stuff with pop, right? Yeah. So this, um, I'm a big pop drinker. I've got my, uh, my 
my Coke Zero right here. <laughs> uh, and so down in the States, they have uh, these soda shops that uh, serve what's called dirty soda. Basically, you take a soda pot base and then you add uh, flavorings and purees just to create a bunch of different flavor combinations. Uh, and I've been down to the States and I've had them and I love them. And I kept thinking or saying, why doesn't someone do that in Edmonton? Like, I would love to have a place like that. I would go there all the time. And of course, nobody ever did. And so then I thought, well, I guess maybe I should just do it. Uh, and so my one of my motivations was I was going to start this small business. So basically, it's a food truck called Druid's Dirty Soda Bar, where we sell cookies and dirty sodas. And that's all we do. And we travel around to different places. We do events. We set up at different locations. And really, my goal was to involve my kids. So I got four kids. Um, the oldest is 20, the youngest is 13. And my hope was that in running this with them, I could kind of teach them about entrepreneurship and how to run a business and how to deal with customers. Uh, and that's been good. So we've just been running it for this first summer. Uh, we've just, businesses kind of started to take off lately. Unfortunately, we're right near the end of the summer, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but it's been, business has been really good. Like the last couple of Saturdays that we've set up, we've had lineups of 20, 30 people for like, two or three hours straight. Wow. So it's been really good. Um, just word of mouth or just yeah, word of mouth, social you. media, uh, social media is probably the biggest part. We've, uh, um, we've had some social media influencers, uh, do little stories about us. And so they've landed on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. Uh, and so most of the people that come, I'll ask them, well, how did you hear about us? And most of them will say, I saw it on Instagram or I saw okay. it on TikTok. So that's been really good. Um, and I've, uh, three of my kids have been involved in it. And so I'm kind of getting, uh, that they're learning about it. Plus I'm kind of scratching that entrepreneurial itch just a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's been good. And this may not be what gets you to be rich, quote unquote, though no, it could. It, it definitely, well, yes. It, it would have to be much bigger to go to rich. But uh, but you're getting a lot of the other things you wanted. Like you said, you're involving your family and getting to teach your kids about entrepreneurship, which could spawn a whole bunch of cool ideas in their own minds. Yes, and that's what I'm hoping is... Uh, they gain some of that same passion that I have for business and entrepreneurship through a little bit through this. Now, I don't want your head to get too big, but um, <laughs> I was curious. And so I tried finding you on like online and I couldn't find you listed by name on like the Nate's website or whatever. They, they must just not list professors and, or if I just didn't know where to find it. No, they don't. They don't list professors. But when I, when I put Drew Woolsey, uh, Nate uh, School of Business, you come up on a website called Rate My Professor. <laughs> have you heard of this website? <laughs> I have heard of that website, yes. Well, again, I don't want your head to get too big, but just for everyone listening, I, I think it would be useful for you to hear some of this stuff. This is pretty amazing. So this Rate My Professor website, students can go on, and if they've had the particular teacher before, they can go on and rate them as horrible or awesome or anywhere in between. You can get a rating between 0 and 100%. And then people can leave reviews and stars and everything. So uh, as of when I printed this about an hour ago, Drew has 152 ratings on this site, the most recent one being just in the last month or two. Almost all of them are five stars. 99% um, is his favorability rating. Here's some cool stuff. So Professor Woolsey's top tags. So when people like think of like what's the one or two words that they think of most to describe you once they've had you as a teacher, this is what comes up. Good feedback, respected, hilarious, <laughs> participation matters, and amazing lectures. So Drew, when you hear those kind of words being used to describe you by a large majority of students that you've had in the past, what kind of comes to your mind? When I first started teaching, I what I tried to keep in my mind was, and you probably had these as well. When I was in university, I had some really great instructors and I had some really, really bad instructors. Uh, and I was really trying to emulate what I thought the really good ones did. And so I, I would think to myself, if I was in this class, what kind of things would I want to do? Uh, and so lots of participation, lots of questions. We watch videos. We try to look at real world examples. And so I've worked really hard to be a good teacher. I mean, and it's nice to know that the students um, are engaging with what I'm doing. Um, and, and, and that's, it's hard to, it's hard to enjoy teaching if the students aren't engaged and seem to be enjoying themselves. So if I'm up there doing something and they look bored, like that's a nightmare for me. <laughs> and, and, and it's hard work that way. But if they're laughing and talking and answering questions and seem like they're 
engaged in what I'm saying, teaching's easy. And so the fact that that I'm getting positive view views, that's awesome. But really, that's that's that just makes my job easier, and it makes me enjoy it more. Well, like for example, the one that really stood out to me. I mean, all of them are great. I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe their teacher as a positive thing as hilarious. <laughs> So what do you, what is it, some of the things that you might do in your class that your teachers were like, this guy's amazing because he's so funny. Uh, and I don't know if I'm so funny. And uh, I would, I think if I had to say, watch my class, kind of like what we're doing here, if I had to watch myself teach, I'd probably be embarrassed by some of the things <laughs> I say and my body language and the things I do. And what I try to do is just, maybe irreverent is kind of a way to do it. So I, I might say things that other teachers might not say or do things that other teachers might not do. I try to have a really casual atmosphere. Uh, so I don't know if all my students would classify me as hilarious, but I think just the fact that I, yeah, will say things that maybe a, a, a normal teacher or a typical teacher might not, um, maybe sets me into that uh, slightly amusing category. Some of the other detailed reviews mentioned things like, um, your grading criteria is very clear. Assignments are easy to complete promptly. Very timely. You're very timely with feedback. Um, this one says, puts a lot of effort into helping students pass this course. Because I imagine it's fun to teach, but it's way more rewarding to see your students really learn. Definitely. The Within the School of Business at Nate, we are... The school is broken up by programs like accounting, finance, management, HR, marketing, uh, entrepreneurship. We're by far the smallest program entrepreneurship is. Uh, we're the newest, we're the smallest. Um, but what we really pride ourselves on, and, and it's so easy with entrepreneurship education to make things really experiential, like really hands-on. So the things you're doing in our class are the exact same things a startup entrepreneur would be doing or a small business owner would be doing. And so it becomes very easy to have them kind of have that light go on. Because if they were working through a, a business plan or working through a target market analysis, and I give them real world examples of how they're actually going to do that when they start their own business or when they get onto the business world, it's again, it's very easy for them to get excited about that. Uh, as You'll probably remember when you were in school and when I was in school, we did lots of things that we've never used again. 100%. And, and I hated that. Like I remember, and I know some people use it, but I took statistics in my undergrad and in my master's and I hated it both times. <laughs> yep. And the number of times I've used it since then is zero. <laughs> and I know some people do, but I haven't. And so I struggled with classes like that. And so that's why I love entrepreneurship education because we're not, we're working real hard not to teach them anything that they won't actually be using when they get out into the world. A very real world. Yeah, we hope so. And I, and I think uh, our reviews uh, within our program and the feedback we get from students is pretty clear that we're doing an okay job of that. Like we're, I think we're doing pretty well. Okay. Well, I know we maybe are, It's I know we're far into this and we haven't even defined what entrepreneurship is. I can tell you that I misspell it pretty sure every time I try to write it and type it. Um, if you had to define what it, entrepreneurship is or what it is to be an entrepreneur, what would you say? How do you define that? What does that even even mean? So, good question. And in one of my classes, that's how we start the class. So one of our one of our very first classes is I write entrepreneurship on the board, and then the students need to go write a definition of entrepreneurship that they like on a different board. Uh, so. I have them all do that. So that means I've got like 40 definitions of entrepreneurship on all the boards and they're not all the same. Um, the, the number one definition, like we just went down to the mall and I asked people what an entrepreneur is. Chances are we'd get somebody who starts a business and that'd probably be the number one bit answer that we get. Um, so entrepreneurship is someone who starts a business, starts something from scratch. But when my students do it, they, they take it much farther than that. Uh, so they look at, you know, people that have a vision, people that take action, people that um, are creative, uh, people that um, kind of think outside of the box. Uh, and what I'm trying to do in when I'm teaching them that concept is I want them to think beyond the entrepreneurs are people that starts businesses. Start, and, and it is that, but I think it's so much more than that. And when one of my classes, I want them to use the definition of an entrepreneur is anyone that creates value. So entrepreneurship is creating value for others. And when we, when we reframe that definition, that means a teacher can be an entrepreneur. Uh, a bus driver 
could be an entrepreneur. Anyone. Basically anyone, right? And and I know that might like if, that might not if we looked up a, a thousand definitions on the internet, we probably wouldn't find that one very often. So it's not maybe the stereotypical definition, but I like that definition of people that create value. And if good good entrepreneurs, people that start businesses, if they are creating value, that means people are likely going to pay you for that value that you're creating. Hmm. What a cool idea, creating value. How, how would you have defined entrepreneurship like b- before I said any of that? <clears throat> well, a couple of years ago, I would have just said what sounded like your most common answer is someone that starts a business. As I looked into it more over the last couple of years, I might have tweaked it a little bit and perhaps too much so. In my mind, I would have said, well, an entrepreneur is someone that, and you kind of said this a little bit, but starts something from scratch, which could be contrasted with someone who you know goes and becomes a, a partner or buys into an already existing venture are they still an entrepreneur i don't know but more maybe more defining as someone who has to put some of their own skin in the game Mm. but again i don't know if that's technically correct but i know when in my own experience and talking working with a lot of other business owners when they got their own skin in the game they treat it differently for sure but again, I wasn't sure if that was an actual technically correct definition. I don't know what it was. So, And I don't know if there is a technically correct definition. We, we could go find 10 entrepreneurship textbooks and they'd probably be a, a similar theme. But I think we would see that there's differences in every single one of those definitions. And we have a healthy debate in class when I talk about something like, so is a franchise owner an entrepreneur? Because they didn't really start it from scratch. Is someone that buys an existing business an entrepreneur? Is someone who joins the family business an entrepreneur? Um, and, and of course, in class, what I'm trying to help them see is that in a way, all of those are entrepreneurship. I don't want them to leave the class saying, okay, the only way you become an entrepreneur is if you start something from scratch with no help from anybody. Like that doesn't exist, really. Um, but I don't know. Like I don't know the answer. Like, and, and, and again, there probably isn't an answer of what, is really an entrepreneur. So when someone is wanting to take your program, how, how does that person determine if the entrepreneurship program that you chair is the right one for them? Yeah, good question. And entrepreneurship schools across the globe struggle with that idea uh, because the, maybe the stereotypical entrepreneur actually doesn't want to go back to school. They don't want to sit in school for two years or four years or six years. They want to just go out and start something, right? And we hear stories all the time of people that left school to go start whatever business they wanted to start. And so convincing people that there's value in coming and getting that education is not easy. And the fact that we're the smallest program at Nate or within the School of Business at Nate uh, testifies to the fact that there's more people that see the path to accounting as a good way to go to school (laughs) as opposed to becoming an entrepreneur. But, and and what I try to reiterate with my students is that the more knowledge that you have, of course, the better chance you've got of succeeding. So probably 95% of the people that go into my program, Entrepreneurship Innovation, are people that genuinely see themselves starting a business one day. And so they, they see this as kind of a stepping stone. They don't necessarily see themselves starting the business right after school. And statistically, we know that's not the case. Most uh, students that leave school don't immediately start a business. It might be five years or 10 years or however many years down the road. Uh, But the hope is we've built that foundation for them so that they've got both the confidence and the skills that when they do actually get to that point, they'll be able to start that business. And even if they don't, those skills and characteristics that we've taught them about entrepreneurship are going to be beneficial in any job that they have. At least that's what we feel. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, in almost any job, especially like if you're in a supervisory or management role, even if it's not your business, you sort of have entrepreneurship-like responsibilities that you could definitely be better at if you had some of those confidence and skills to treat it basically like that's your baby. Yeah, definitely. Can you imagine actually how cool it would be if every employee in a business treated it like it was theirs? Oh, it would change everything, right? Uh, one of the hardest things, and you know this, about being a business owner is bringing in employees. that You want employees that care about the business as much as you do. Which is near impossible. It is near impossible. Uh, but but again, it, like, if we go back to your definition of entrepreneurship, if they had skin in the game. So if you were able to somehow, every employee you brought in, you gave them ownership in the business, which is 
difficult, but if, let's say you did that. In theory, they would all treat it like their baby because it is. They, they would be making money when the business makes money. Yeah. Uh, and we saw that for lots of years. WestJet yeah, I was gonna say. Had, had a really uh, generous stock option plan. And so they prided themselves on all our employees are, are owners. And they won awards for their high levels of customer service. And, and they would credit a lot to that because of that. Yeah. yeah it gives you a lot to think about. Um, I know when I think of like starting a business, and I'm just going to speak to my own experience. I know, that, at least for me, there was a relationship between wanting to start a business or maybe not wanting to, having the courage to start a business and my sort of what I term as my risk tolerance. Yeah. And I would always tell you, at least especially most of my life up until a few years ago, I had like zero risk tolerance. I was like, if there's any chance this is not going to work out, I'm going to choose a different career path. Yeah. But I'm guessing I'm not the only one that comes up against this precipice of, I have this really good idea or I really want to run my own business, but I don't think I have the risk tolerance to do it. And then somehow they just do it anyways. Yeah. How does that, how does a person, because maybe there's people listening today, they're in this exact boat. They've got a really cool idea for a business venture, but that risk tolerance is like, I just, I can't do it if there's any uncertainty in that. Yeah. How, do, how do you navigate that? How do you advise them? Well, and it's interesting because we, we know that entrepreneurship is incredibly risky, right? We know that the vast majority of businesses fail uh, over a certain period of time. And so, the fact that people are scared of that is they rightfully should be a little bit scared. Often they won't, they'll say things like, so you talk to a friend who says, oh, I've got a good business idea. And you say something, well, why don't you start it? And they'll say things like, well, I don't have the money or I don't have the time or I don't, whatever. Uh, and most of those are just veiled excuses for, I'm super afraid. <laughs> like it's scary. And I'm not afraid of, you know, heights or spiders or snakes, but I'm terrified of failure. Like I don't, I don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything that I'm going to fail at. And I think that's the vast majority of the population. Failure is, is terrifying. And so how do you, how do you get past that? Um, part of that is, and I, and I remind my students of this is obviously the more knowledge you have, the, the more confidence you're going to have. So coming to school, reading business books, talking to other entrepreneurs, all those things are going to lower that level of fear that, that's inside of you. Uh, but ultimately, I think the only way to get past something that's really scaring you is to do it. And so the nice thing about the world that we live in today, you hear things like terms like side hustle and side gig. And basically what these are, are people keeping their full-time day job and then starting a little business, uh, some kind of side hustle. Uh, and that's a very easy way to kind of dip your toe into the world of entrepreneurship. And the hope is that you recognize, and if you have some success, that it's not quite as terrifying as you thought that it was. Uh, you know, if you go and remortgage your house and sell all your retirement funds and all those things, the the worst case scenario is you're living under a bridge somewhere. <laughs> and that's, that is terrifying. Um, but if it's, okay, I'm gonna, I found I got $2,000. I'm gonna start this little thing. And then the internet has made it possible so that anyone could start a very small business on the side uh, and then hopefully build up some confidence and maybe that leads to the next one and the next one and the next one then maybe one day you do start that that big business and uh, but i think that's the only way to get past that fear is to just do it a little bit well you mentioned something that i think i would have deemed as crucial as well and you know it's not biased because i don't teach like you do but the the knowledge piece the mm -hmm. i think sometimes what we're afraid of is what we don't know yeah so if you, the more you can learn about everything you can, the less you don't know and the less fear there might be of the unknown. Well, in the world we live in today, the, the opportunities to learn are just infinite, right? You don't have to come back and go to school and get a degree with a school like mine. You can learn so much about entrepreneurship and business just on the internet. Just watch YouTube videos, read books, blogs, podcasts. The, there, there's really no excuse today to not, learn the things you need to learn because it's it's all out there. What would you say to someone who's sort of on the fence between the two things you just said? Either quitting their current job, giving up, putting all their future finances on the line to go all in versus the safe, I'll call it the safer approach maybe where I'm going to keep my full-time job and the certainty with that and just do a side hustle. Is there an advantage to one over the other? I'm a real believer in the 
calculated risks. And so, so I, I kind of put those in very polar opposite sides, okay? All in or side hustle. And it doesn't need to be so polarized. There could be lots of varying degrees in between. So you might be starting that all in business, but you're not, you may not make money for the first six months, year, two years, who knows? So if it was me, I would keep that full-time job for as long as you possibly can. Uh, maybe you might use the criteria of as soon as my business makes enough money to supplant my current income, then I'll quit that job and then I'll go all in on the business. What that'll mean, unfortunately, is there may be a time when you are almost working two full-time jobs because you're keeping the security <laughs> plus you're doing the entrepreneurship, which is hard, but I really like that idea of keeping the security and taking the risk at the same time, I think. And I think we, we've seen lots of successful entrepreneurs do things like that. Kind of stay one foot on safety for as long as you possibly can. That's good advice. In your experience, either working with students, running your own business, teaching entrepreneurship, talking with other business owners, can you identify what you would deem like some key necessary qualities or characteristics or whatever of a successful entrepreneur? Yeah. Good question. And, and then that's another discussion we have in class. So as a, a class, we'll go through and list what they think are all the, the top characteristics. And we'll make this huge list. Um, and at the end, we'll look at all these things and I'll say, okay, does anyone, do you, who in this room has all of these characteristics? And of course, nobody does, right? Uh, and you're an entrepreneur and you don't have all of those characteristics. No. Uh, and so it's, the the point I'm trying to make for them is, okay, you don't need to have all these to be successful, but you do need to have some of them. For me, and this this is very much anecdotal evidence, I think per perseverance is the, one of the most important things any entrepreneur can have. Uh, especially when you're first starting your business, it can be not only scary as we talked about before, but you may not see results for a while and results, sales, money, all of those things. And so how long do you kind of fight through that until you kind of get to that tipping point where you actually make money. And we, we know statistically that most people don't make it past that point uh, because they get scared or it's too hard or whatever. So most of the time, even these overnight success entrepreneurs, they just ground it out for as long enough until finally they got to a point where they actually started to make money. And I think, and this just doesn't apply to entrepreneurship. I think in order to be successful in anything, Perseverance is everything. You don't have to be exceptionally smart. You don't have to necessarily be the hardest worker in the room or the most charismatic or the best salesperson or any of those things. But if you are just willing to not just work hard, but keep working hard, I think I think eventually you'll be successful in anything you want to do. And I think entrepreneurship is very much the case there. You mentioned one that I'm curious about because I think... I know I don't feel this way about myself, and I think a lot of other people would deem themselves not this either, but this what you said about here's all your ideal characteristics, but nobody has them all, and you don't need them all. You just need some. Yeah. Perseverance being among a key. I think people might particularly stereotypically think, oh, well, I don't have what it takes to be successful in business because I don't have an outgoing personality. I don't, I don't like people. I'm not extroverted. I, I'd much rather be a behind-the-scenes kind of guy or girl. But... From what you're talking about, that's really not as relevant as people probably assume. Yeah, I mean, I think there needs to be some of that. And, and if you're incredibly shy, you probably do need to push yourself out a little bit. But I don't think you have to be the loudest person in the room. You don't need to be the life of the party. Uh, we know that in order to be successful in business, one of the keys is to figure out who your target market is and provide value for those people. So your tar target market may not even, they may not even want that person who's really extroverted. They may want the quiet expert that really knows their stuff. Uh, and so you might stereotypically think, yeah, you need to be that amazing salesperson who talks to everybody. And, and I'm not that person. I'm very much not. Uh, I kind of force myself to be extroverted <laughs> when I have to be, uh, but I don't thrive on that. And so, I, yeah, I think that's a perfect example of you don't have to be that person. Again, having said that, you're going to have to talk to people. Like, it, you're going to have to work with people. And so you got to get to at least a certain level of comfortability with that. I want to go back to one other thing you said too that I think is interesting. Um, and this may not have a real answer, but I'm curious what you'd say. You mentioned that you think perseverance would be one of the most key characteristics. So I guess my question would be, 
Do you feel like any business, if the owner was perseverant enough, would eventually succeed? <laughs> and that's, you're pointing out one of the most difficult challenges of every entrepreneur. If you've ever watched Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, you'll hear these people come on and they, they present this terrible idea that the sharks or the dragons just tear apart. And then they'll ask a question, well, how long have you been doing this? Oh, 15 years. And they're shocked. And they, well, how much money do you have invested in this? Oh, $250,000. And, and then the sharks or the dragons will tell them, stop now, like quit. And, and, and then that's tough, right? Because this person believes in their business and they're persevering. Even despite the haters, they just keep going. And so how do you know? How do you know when it's time to kill that idea and move on to something else or to do something else? Uh, and I don't know if there's a really great answer. And there isn't a really great answer because we know some businesses didn't make money for years and years. Like it took Amazon 12, 15 years before they actually turned a profit. Uh, and if Jeff Bezos had quit, then he wouldn't be printing money like he is today. And I have um, to find a new way of buying most of the stuff I buy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and so, no, I, I don't. There's got to be a time to cut the cord on things and say, no, this isn't working, or I need to pivot. I need to iterate into something else. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, perseverance is important, but there's got to be a point where you say, no, enough is enough. But I don't know when that is, and I don't know if anybody does. And obviously, it's going to be different in every situation. Exactly. Yeah. Am I just am I just pig headed and moving forward with a bad idea, or am I just really sticking it out and eventually I'm going to be successful? I don't know the answer. It's fair. One of the questions I'm going to ask you, but I'm not sure it's relevant anymore. But I guess I'll ask it anyways, and you can confirm if it's not relevant anymore. Like you go back to the exercise you said you have your students. Can like what qualities does a successful entrepreneur have? And then we kind of use that as a teaching moment. And my question was going to be, those qualities, do you feel they're ones that can be learned and taught? Or do they, you feel like they're ones that you kind of either born with or you don't got it? And if perseverance is a key one, I, I feel like that's a quality that people could develop. Yeah. But overall, this concept of nature versus nurture when it comes to entrepreneurship, do you feel like certain people are just... You don't have what it takes. You just weren't born with what you need type of thing. Or can anybody learn how to be successful in business? A, a, a kind of an age-old question, right? And we, we can apply that to anything, right? Are you born or are you made in this? And I, and I ask the exact same question to my students. We'll go through and have that discussion. Do you think entrepreneurs or do you think salespeople are born or are they made? Uh, and thankfully, the vast majority of students will put their hand up and say that they think they can be made. Uh, and as a entrepreneurship educator, if I didn't believe that, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. I'm, I'm wasting my time, right? Because the vast majority of people are not born super perseverant and really comfortable with risk and have the ability to talk to people and persuade people. We, we're just not born like that. Some people are, and they of course have a advantage potentially over people that don't. But because we teach this stuff, we genuinely believe that we can teach you to do most of those things. There's actually a great book called, um, called Mindset by Carol Dweck. Okay. Uh, so she talks about uh, basically, the whole book is, is revolves around this idea of a growth mindset, which is the idea that you can grow your brain. You can learn basically anything. And the second that you decide that you can't do that, all you're doing is limiting your ability to succeed in any area of your life. So whether that's entrepreneurship or learning a language or anything, you genuinely have to believe that no matter how old or young or <laughs> soggy my brain is, I can learn to do that thing. And so are there people that genetically or through upbringing are more predisposed to be successful as entrepreneurs? Sure, they're, they're out there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't teach almost anybody with the desire to be successful. At least in my opinion. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, one of, like, in my field of work, I work with a lot of business owners when at the point they are decided to start a business. And I find a common situation is they were an employee and either they lost their job or they had a realization that they could do what they were doing for their boss 
and either make more money doing it for themselves or have more freedom or sometimes just they could do it better. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any trends over the years you've been teaching and doing this that sort of are more common catalysts for people saying, you know what, now's the time for me to start my business venture? Yeah, statistically, we know that the number one source of new businesses is current employment. So whether that's, yeah, like you said, I could do this better than them, or um, I worked here and then I moved to a different place and then I started that same business. And it makes a lot of sense, right? If you uh, have kind of seen the inner workings of a specific kind of business or a specific industry, it would make sense that you would start a business like that. Uh, and I don't have statistics on this, but I'd be willing to bet that we, there's probably a higher success rate in businesses that do that. Uh, because again, they know the ins and out of that industry. They know the target market. They know uh, what people value. And so I, I don't know if I have any specific trends in relation to that, but I do know that that's yeah incredibly common way or source of business ideas. And what do you think are some other catalysts that trigger people to want to start a business that you've seen? Um, so other uh, kind of when we look at where business ideas come from, uh, like I said, current income or sorry, current uh, job experience would be number one. Under that would be things like hobbies. Uh, so things that you enjoy doing, you like photography, you like baking, uh, that often leads to people starting business ideas. I always warn my students that the second you start a business based on a hobby, you most of the time are actually going to destroy that hobby. <laughs> you won't like it anymore, maybe. No, yeah. You, you were a woodworker and you really liked that and then people started ordering them and now you have deadlines and now you have bills to pay. <laughs> uh, and so it kind of destroys that. Uh, other ones, uh, travel is quite a common catalyst. I encourage my students that if you have opportunities to travel, get out there. If we, you and I were to go to Thailand tomorrow, I bet we could find 50 business ideas for things that they're doing in Thailand that we're not doing in Edmonton. Mm, that's a good idea. And so I think that's an amazing way because I think what the, the analogy I use for my students is most of the time we walk around our life with these blinders on. And the blinders are there because we live in the same city and we were raised by our parents and our experience just limits how we see the world. And so the more you can travel or do things like read, uh, learn about different things, be curious, it just opens those blinders up a little bit wider. And so you start to realize that this world that you think is the entire world is no, it's just your tiny little piece of the world. And so once you get out there and see what's happening uh, and and you're, you've kind of trained your brain to see the world through the eyes of an entrepreneur, you just see business ideas everywhere. And so travel is a, a really great way to kind of open the, widen those blinders up a little bit. Hmm. Gives me one more reason to want to travel there more, I guess. Absolutely. Um, I don't, I, I don't know what this term even really means. I used to think I knew what it means. So I'll explain what I thought it means. And then you'll tell me what it actually means. So we've talked about entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. And then there's a kind of a companion term I sometimes hear tossed around. And I don't know if it's new or I just never really heard it much until now. Intrapreneur. What I thought that meant was I haven't started my own business, but I am being entrusted by owner A, B, or C to sort of now run their business. Mm -hmm. But I'm not actually sure that my understanding of that is correct either. So what is an intrapreneur? How does it differ from an entrepreneur? Yeah, good question. So two and a half years ago, we actually introduced a class in the School of Business at Nate called Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, and this came from feedback we were getting from industry, letting us know that people that think and act like an entrepreneur were very valued out in the world. So if you could have an employee who's, who's creative, and is good at problem solving and is perseverant. All the things we want in an entrepreneur, if we could have employees that think and act like that, those would be a great asset to a business. And so we recognize, again, that most students in school aren't gonna start their own business, at least not right away. And so we thought, okay, how do we introduce a class where we can teach people the skills and the characteristics and the traits of entrepreneurs and apply them in their life, whether they start a business or not. And so that's how we're defining entrepreneurship. So a person that thinks and acts like an entrepreneur inside an existing business. So whether they own the business, run the business or not, all the way from the bottom level employee, all the way from the top level CEO, we believe that the business owners want all those people and everybody in between, again, to be creative, 
to be able to solve problems, to think outside the box. Think like to, an owner, like we talked about. Exactly, exactly. So ju just like what an owner would do. And so that that's basically what that entire class is about, is we know most of you aren't going to start a business. So let's teach you how to be an entrepreneur. And you can apply that to every area of your life. So that's how we define entrepreneurship. And the reason why most people have never heard of that word is because I think it's just largely, made up. largely a made up. <laughs> uh, it's also defined as maybe a corporate entrepreneur. Uh, that would be another way that you may have read it in other books. Okay. If somebody's listening to this podcast and they think, you know what? I have a really cool business idea, but I don't really know how to take it from where it is to reality. Like what are some like, key first steps that you would recommend to someone who's kind of thinking about starting a business? Yeah, good question. The Again, one of the great things about the world we live in today is there's no shortage of knowledge out there. Obviously, if you have nowhere to start, you may not even know what to type in to Google to figure out where to get that information. There's lots of great organizations uh, throughout Canada and Alberta uh, and even in Edmonton that can kind of help point you in the right direction. Uh, so organizations like Business Link, uh, they're a government-funded organization and their only job is to help people start and run businesses. Uh, and lots of the things they offer are completely free. Futurepreneur, same kind of idea. It's aimed at younger entrepreneurs, but same thing. Help you start businesses. Um, and again, most of what they offer is free. Edmonton Unlimited, um, also a government-funded organization. Again, only job is to help people start businesses. And so there's lots of resources out there, uh, again, that are largely free that can help point you in the right direction. They're not going to do the work for you, uh, but they can kind of help you. If you've got that idea and you just have no idea where to go, they can point you where to go and help you uh, get to that next step. Would they also be able to point in the direction or help you give ideas for like funding? Definitely. Yeah. And so some of those organizations actually offer funding. Uh, so Fruitspreneur is a good example. It's the one I'm most familiar with because a lot of my students are younger. And so they're, I can't, I think that it tops out at, it's either 30 or 35. Uh, so anywhere from 18 to 35 is kind of their, their target market. Uh, and they'll offer mentorship and training and they'll uh, help you with your business plan and all that stuff. And then they also offer small loans as well. Uh, and so uh, Business Development Bank of Canada, that was another one. Uh, so again, they're they're uh, a government sponsored organization, and their their job is to help provide loans for entrepreneurs. So that that can be often the common excuse: I can't start a business because I don't have any money. The money's out there; like, there's money there. It's just a matter of setting yourself up to be able to get it. So organizations like that can definitely help with that. Okay, so those are some good resources. We can put them in our show notes too, so people can reference them afterwards. Um. And trying to think about what other things I thought would be useful to understand for uh, entrepreneurship. I mean, I mean, as you pointed out, most of the people you get to teach are not yet running their own business. They're just interested in it or have may someday down the road start it. For somebody that's already done that and either having second thoughts or questioning if they're maybe getting to that perseverance should stop now kind of met, like how would you walk through or advise someone who's already in the midst of their business venture and maybe not sure where to take it or not sure how to grow it or just not sure what to do with it? Let me throw that question back to you. So you obviously have your own business and yes. you're running it. So when you've had questions, you haven't been, un you've been unsure of what to do. What have you done? Not sure it's always the best answer, but tried to follow my gut. <laughs> that um, is a good answer seek out people who are much smarter than me in areas that I don't have possessed knowledge or skill in and that's them or interview people who are successfully doing what I want to be doing and find out what they do. Yeah. That, that was actually going to be my answer was like, get out and talk to people. Uh, one of the most important things I tell my students that they need to do is they need to build their network. So they need to get out and talk to people. They need to go to networking events. They need to find people like, as you said, that are smarter than they are. And so when you come to a problem, so for instance, you've got a major human resource problem in your business and you have no idea how to do it. I about guarantee that if you started looking through your network, you could probably find two, three, four, five people that could probably advise you on that and would probably be happy to do that because you've probably nurtured those relationships in a way that they're happy to help you. Uh, and so I think that those people that do create those relationships and they do find ways to give to other people um, 
will find that there's lots of ways that those people will give back to you. And so I think if, if you're just using what's in your head to try to solve every problem that you have, you're going to hit a brick wall more often than not because we just don't know, again, what we don't know. And so building those relationships, I think, is just so valuable. And and the knowledge is out there, right? Like pe- there's people that know things that you don't know. Do you, on that note, do you have any like, I don't use this word lightly, but like mentors or heroes in your life that have kind of inspired you? You've mentioned some family members that have been entrepreneurs, but like, mm-hmm. is there any like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk of the world or just maybe on a much more local scale that have you've kind of looked up to? Well, what, one of my, again, one of my favorite things about being a teacher is I bring in guest speakers all the time. Uh, and it's awesome because I, and most of these are people that I've met at events or met through other teachers or met through things like this. And I found that with almost 100% success rate, when I ask people out in the business world to come back and give to students, again, I close almost every single time because the second that they hear, um, you, I need you to come help my students, most people are just happy to do that. And so because of that, I've been able to create some really great relationships with people that are very successful in entrepreneurship right here in Edmonton. And so I, I would consider all of those people, whether we call them mentors or friends or connections or whatever they are, uh, and and most of them won't even know that. They won't even know that they've had an impact on my life. Uh, but just the fact that I get to sit in class and they're talking to my students, but I'm also learning from all of uh-huh. those people. Uh, and then and then also I'm a, a prodigious reader. I, I love to read business books. And so I'm constantly reading. And so I, I would consider all of those people the kind of the business greats of our time as as mentors of mine, even though they don't know that because I've been able to learn from them. Well, on that note, what are some of your highly recommended business books? Oh, good question. So the book I've read the most is The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Michael Gerber so yeah. anyone, if you're an entrepreneur at any stage of your existence, uh, I encourage you to read that one. It's so good. Uh, that's one of my one of my favorites. Uh, Purple Cow by Seth Godin. It's kind of it's more of a marketing book, but I think it's very much connected to entrepreneurship. That's uh, one of my favorites. Uh, Start with Why by Simon Sinek. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of that one. I remember the first time I, I read that book a couple, two or three times. And the first time I read it, I just couldn't put it down. Just that whole idea of it, people don't buy what you sell. They buy By why you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one I really, really enjoyed. Um, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading a couple of biographies right now. Uh, so uh, one of Henry Ford and another one of the CEO of Sonic, like obviously very different uh, biographies, but I love reading biographies of successful entrepreneurs as well. Um, I th- I, you just can't go wrong with reading. One of my favorites was um, Sam Walton wrote a biography mm. of uh, Walmart. Obviously, founder of Walmart. That was such a good one. One of my favorite things about him is he everywhere he would go, he would ask people questions, and it would drive his family crazy because they'd go on vacation, and they would go to a diner, and then his dad would just pepper the waiter or waitress with questions, trying to understand how the diner worked, and what they did, like understand their job and everything about it. Everywhere he went, he did that. And I think as an entrepreneur, kind of getting that curious mindset, like I want to understand everything, I think is is a good skill that we could take from Sam Walton and apply into our lives. When I think of Sam Walton in particular, and one of the books that I've listened to on an audio book of late, it might've actually been Simon Sinek, Start With Why, who dives in a lot into Sam Walton in particular and his stuff. But this gets into a question I want to ask you. I don't even know exactly what I'm trying to ask, but like businesses would have a high level success rate if they can find something in the market that is a missing system or a gap or a otherwise something that is just they can they can do it better or different or fill a missing need somehow. Mm-hmm. When you see, because I think one of the projects you often have some of your students do is they run a mock business for a while as one of their things. Yep. I know when I was at Nate a couple of years ago, I happened to be there on a day where I don't know what it was called, but these people were kind of displaying their businesses for the local community to come in and see just so they can kind of show up their cool business ideas. And yeah. um, anyway, so when, when that kind of thing is happening, are you finding a lot of those businesses are trying to capitalize on what they see as like a missing need? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, 
too often aspiring entrepreneurs think they have to find some kind of crack the universe open idea, like something that's never been done before. I need to invent the car that runs on, I don't know, air or something <laughs> like that. Like something that's just never been done. But most businesses don't start like that. Most innovations within business are, we take this thing that's already working and then we just give it a slight tweak and then it becomes way better. So Sam Walton's an example, right? Um, he created uh, Walmart, which was essentially a, a retail store that sold lots of different things. That already existed. Like even in, in his day, he wasn't reinventing the wheel. All he did was make it a little bit better. He had a little bit better customer service. He had a little bit better prices. He had a little bit better variety in the things he sold. That's it. And so I think most of the time, that's what innovation becomes. Just a slight tweak on something that's already being done just to make it a little bit better. Apple's a really good example, right? They didn't invent, most of the things they sell, like they didn't invent the computer, they didn't invent the phone, they didn't invent the MP3 player, but they made ones that were- People wanted. People wanted them because they were prettier and they worked better and they were a little bit more, more user-friendly. So again, just slight tweaks and then people lined up to buy what they were selling. You alluded to this book earlier, so I want to dive onto this thread for just a minute. Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. I mean, some of the examples you just quoted, he would argue that a key different ingredient between Sam Walton and Steve Jobs and then other businesses that were doing similar things were they were selling why they were doing it. They mm. would talk about the why first and then dive more into the what after they knew their why. Yeah. For any business owner, any entrepreneur, would you say that learning what their why is and keeping that kind of front and center is a crucial aspect of that? Oh, definitely. I think if your your only why is to make a buck, when things get hard, which they inevitably do, entrepreneurship is a grind. Uh, Elon Musk was once quoted, as he, I, think, I think he was quoting someone else, but he said, entrepreneurship is like chewing glass and staring into the abyss. <laughs> but then he follows up closely after that saying, well, but there's nothing else I would rather do. Uh, so entrepreneurship is hard. And so if you're doing something just to make money, when that journey gets really, really hard, there's a pretty good chance you're going to bail. You're going to do something else. And, and you should, right? Um, there's other ways to make money that are easier than being an entrepreneur. Uh, but if you've got a really compelling why, whether you're helping people or this is really good for your family or it brings you a lot of passion or contentment or whatever it is, those things are going to carry you through. Uh, I, when I explain this to my students, I call it the valley of despair. When you first start a business, you're super excited about it and everything's going to work and the world's amazing and I love everything. And then people start saying no and people don't buy as much and the government, there's lots of red tape and, and it gets hard. And then we call that the valley of despair. And if you can't get out of that, then yeah, the business dies and you go do something else. But if you've got a compelling why, that's going to be that thing that helps you climb back out, up back to the top of the mountain. And you may go back down later on, but you need that thing, whatever it is that pushes you forward. It's just like having kids, uh, right? You've got kids, I've got kids. It's hard to be a parent, uh, but because you love them, you keep going. You keep doing it, despite the fact that sometimes they drive you crazy <laughs> and sometimes you fail and sometimes it's really, really hard. But the why is I love them and, and I want them to be successful and I want to be a good dad. And you need that as an entrepreneur as well. And, and that's not the same for everybody. Um, Steve Jobs' why might be completely different than the person who owns a gas station in Edmonton. But still, if you can have that why that gets you up in the morning and keeps you going, I think it's essential. Okay. And then you mentioned as I would deem your interpreting your words as almost required reading if you really want to start a business, the E-Myth, Michael Gerber, what's, what would you say is a key takeaway that he teaches in that book that you think every entrepreneur would benefit from knowing? Yeah, so he the, the, the basic the, uh, idea behind the book is most of the time uh, an entrepreneur is someone who's really, or, sorry, the person that typically starts a business is someone who's really good at something. Uh, so really good at, and the example he uses is baking pies. Yeah. So I'm really good at baking pies, so I start a pie business. And then the business gets so big that I actually don't have time to bake pies anymore because I'm hiring people and I'm doing the accounting and I'm doing all these things. And so I'm not doing the things that I love. And then what happens is 
the pie quality starts to go down because I'm not making the pies anymore. And then I'm hating my life as well. <laughs> and then I shrink the business back down and I just make pies and it never works. You never make money because you never get out of the kitchen. And so he uses the example of McDonald's that McDonald's figured out how to systematize everything. So if I go to a McDonald's in Edmonton and I buy a Big Mac, in theory, that's going to taste the same as the Big Mac I buy in Texas tomorrow. And it's because of systems. So his the whole idea behind the book is, is an entrepreneur needs to figure out how to put systems in place that ensure product quality, whether you're there or not. Because if you are dependent on providing the value of the business, then if you get sick or you die or you get too busy, then the value plummets. So you got to figure out how do I provide value whether I'm there or not. And, and that's kind of what the whole e-myth is about is how do you systematize a business? Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. I remember the first time I was listening to that book, I was like, wow. And I, I remember he describes like a situation where he went to a hotel and because of things that they had in place, he got to his hotel room and they had his favorite candy on his pillow and they had his favorite newspaper on his bed and they all this stuff. And he's just like, I was just wowed because yeah. they they just they had this whole system that just worked. And none of it was reliant on who? one person or no. the who at all. Yeah. yeah, just like McDonald's, you can take any teenager out of that system and plug in another teenager. And in theory, the fries continue to come out salty and delicious. Now, having recently traveled to the United States, my kids would tell you that an American McDonald's meal tastes a little bit different than a Canadian one. <laughs> well, inevitably, it probably will. But, but theoretically, yes. Yes. I want to. We we spent a lot of time together. I'm very grateful that you've been here. Um, before we wrap up, I want to dive into one of other two other concepts and ask you a mm -hmm. last question or two. We talked about this earlier. We didn't dive into it because I, I know it's a scary place to go, but um, it might be a useful conversation. So I don't want to leave it out. I've heard successful entrepreneurs say, and I think Donald Trump would be one as successfully have been, like would say this on a, multiple occasions that failure is not like a reason not to do something, mm -hmm. right? I'm quoting it wrong, but basically I've failed numerous times and it's a, it's a good catalyst for continuing to start a new business. Yeah. Um, for someone that is wanting to start a business and is afraid of failure, or someone who feels like maybe they're at that it's time to cut the cord on this one. I don't know how I can ever pick myself up to start a new one because I failed this one. How do you get past that either fear or failure or I've already failed, but I'm going to learn from it instead of letting me like hold me down. Well, and you hit the nail on the head, right? Is we, we just need to reframe what failure means, right? Is failure needs to be learning. Right, uh, it's just like when uh, a little kid is learning how to walk; they fall a thousand times, and if every time they fell that was failure, then it would be hard for them to get back up. Instead, they see it as this is just part of the process. And one of the stats I'd like to share with my students to help them reframe this is: the vast majority of successful entrepreneurs have actually had two, three, four failed businesses before the big one. they had the big one. Uh, and, and if you look statistically at people that we see as very successful entrepreneurs, that is absolutely accurate. They had a bunch of failures, but they kept going. And so if you see it as this is just part of, this is the journey. I remember when I was in sales, I had to remind myself that in order to get a yes, I needed to get five no's. So once I got the two no's, I was like, ah, I just have to do three more no's and then I'm going to get to my yes. And of course that was never completely accurate, but that was the way you need to switch your mind to is in order for me to be successful, I need to fall down two, three, four times. And through those, I'll learn something every single time. And then that'll lead to success. Again, I don't like failure. I hate it. I'm terrified of it. It's my least favorite thing. Uh, and as an entrepreneur teacher, I think... I'm smarter than the average person, so I shouldn't fail at all, but that's not true. I talked earlier about the business that I'm, the little food truck that I'm running right now. I've made lots of mistakes and I should be smarter than that. I, I shouldn't have made those mistakes because I have the knowledge, but it, it doesn't matter. We still make mistakes. We still fall. We still fail. Uh, if something you want to do, then just let that be part of the apprenticeship program, making mistakes. Costly education, but sometimes a very much needed one. 
Yeah, and there's a quote, and I can't remember who it was. It was a famous tennis player, and, and she said that uh, failure is the best teacher. She says, when you're winning, you you think you have it all figured out, uh, but you absolutely don't. And then when you start to lose, that's actually when you really are learning things because you are you are now you have some humility and you recognize there's things you need to work on. So continually being successful is really just, you know, to a certain extent, it's making you weak. Uh, and so you need to fail. Sometimes you need to make mistakes. Part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to conclude this episode about entrepreneurship without kind of diving into that because I'm sure that's on the back of, well, as you said, you've been doing this a long time and it's still on the back of your mind a little bit. Yeah. Is there anything else you can think of that we haven't covered today that you think an uh, aspiring entrepreneur or a current entrepreneur would benefit from knowing or hearing? I, I think if I could end with one thing, it would be this idea that if we were to look if there was a way that we could take every successful entrepreneur in the world and kind of break them down demographically of who they are and how they are, I think we would recognize that there is no mold for a successful entrepreneur. There is no one type of person. There's no one way to be successful. And so if you look at the, the Steve Jobs and the Jeff Bezos and the Mark Zuckerberg and the Elon Musk, they look kind of like the same person to a certain extent. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm not those people. I'm not Elon Musk. I, I just, I can't do what he did. And that could paralyze you and think, no, I can't be successful. Uh, but they represent a tiny, tiny portion of successful entrepreneurs. And we just see them because they're in the limelight. But I think we would recognize that people from, you know, thousands of different backgrounds and, and skill levels and characteristics and traits. And so what I'm really trying to get across to my students, and I think anyone aspiring to be an entrepreneur needs to recognize that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter who your parents are. You can be successful. And there's people out there just like you that have done it. And so don't, don't limit your desire to jump into this. If it's something you want to do, just because you don't think you're Elon Musk, you don't have to be. Anyone can be successful at this if they really want it. Thank you. I think that's a pretty, pretty powerful place to end. I am going to ask you one other question though. All right. And I only ask you this question because I know that you love teaching and you have, if I remember what you said correctly, 11 to 13 years worth of students that have come and gone through your classrooms. Yeah. If any of them are listening to this podcast. I'm sure they all are. You can make it required reading if you want. <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, but if any of them are listening to this podcast, what, what would you like to say to them? Oh, good question. I didn't prepare you for this. So I, this is purely on the spot, but what would you like, what message would you want to share with them if anyone was listening? I think it would be, uh, if, if I could connect kind of what we've talked about plus what I do in school, um, is very much this idea that knowledge becomes power. And so if you want to be successful, like keep, and, and I don't just mean in school, just keep learning. Uh, I don't, I think people that, that often succeed are just people that have worked harder to be a little smarter than the person next to them. And I don't just mean intellect or intelligence, but lots of different ways of being smart. And so, yeah, if my students are listening, uh, don't stop learning once you're finished school, keep learning, keep reading, keep getting smarter. And I think you'll you'll recognize that uh, success will follow if you're willing to keep learning. Awesome. There. So all you student, former students of Drew Woolsey who are listening, some great advice, and I hope you are listening. I want to thank Drew Woolsey, my guest, for being here on our podcast today. I think we've been inspired and uplifted, and I've learned a lot. So I'm hoping that lots of others listening have learned a lot too. Um, I'm going to encourage you to look for the food truck that Drew Woolsey runs. Can you remind us again what it's called? Druid's Dirty Soda Bar. Okay. Any ideas where they can find you next? So easiest place, look for us on Facebook and Instagram. We post every week where we're going to be because we, we're in different places all the time. So Now, again, your your food truck is based on you taking like based sodas like Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola, Mountain Dew, whatever, and then making them more fun. Yes, adding different flavors. You have a fruits. favorite menu item on your truck list uh so currently my favorite so i'm a uh, as i mentioned i'm a coke guy and so my current favorite drink is called the marty robbins uh which is a coke base with blackberry vanilla and lime i think it's delicious 
My my kids went to your food truck and had one that reminded them of butterbeer. I don't remember what it was called. It, it was called butterbeer. Okay. Yeah. But <laughs> it was, they loved it. It Good. was amazing. Root beer, butterscotch, vanilla. Butter so beer. yeah, look for the food truck. Uh, again, if you're interested in learning more about entrepreneurship, I invite you to check out uh, Drew's um, classes and stuff at Nate. And uh, otherwise, you can, I believe, can find you on pretty much every social media channel. Um, but yeah, that's our episode for today on entrepreneurship. Again, thanks to Drew for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. You've been listening to the Business Speak podcast featuring Mr. Chill. Be sure to subscribe and add us to your podcast library to ensure you never miss an episode. We love hearing from our listeners. If you have a topic or question you'd like us to discuss, would like to be a guest on our show, or would otherwise like to get in touch with us, please visit our website at businessspeak.ca. Thanks for listening to Business Speak, the language of business simplified. Simplified. Simplified.